Hello girls. We are covering the endocrine system, which is a mysterious system to most. So basically, if you equate endocrine with hormones, that's a pretty fair way of summarizing what the endocrine system is. It consists of all the endocrine glands, which secrete hormones, and uh, hormones regulate much more than the famous sex hormones. They regulate many, many aspects of our body and our body chemistry. Our body makes about 50 different hormones. Um, hormones, you can uh, use the term that we've been using in the past if you want to give a really quick two-word definition, chemical messengers, although we'll obviously elaborate on that. And as for glands, you can simply think of them as the organs or the cells, because sometimes it's cells within an organ, right? The organs are the cells which produce and secrete a substance. And I think that's fairly intuitive, such as sweat glands, salivary glands, um, or there can be an entire organ, which is a gland, such as the pancreas or the thymus. Okay, so the first thing is that, as usual, when I start a screencast, my computer gets stuck. There it is. Okay, um, these are all the glands we're going to be labeling. Um, just a close-up here. Uh, this is a close-up of this. The kidneys are these, and on top of the kidneys are these little, um, I call them little dwarf hats, especially one of them looks more like a dwarf hat, and they're the adrenal glands. If you remember, renal means of the kidney, um, so that part's a little bit difficult to see. Okay, so this diagram lays them out for you. Skip these for a moment. The thyroid has these tiny little sections called the parathyroid. We'll look at it in a minute. The thymus is right... But this is just below the larynx. This is just in front of your heart. Here are the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys. This is the pancreas. We learned about it in the digestive system, but it's also an endocrine gland. And there is both the male testes and the female ovaries. Um, now let's zoom in on this part. There are two glands and one part of the brain that are re relevant. The one gland, we talked about it before, is the pituitary gland. It is not part of the brain. It's just hanging in the center of your skull at the base of your brain there. Um, and it's very important for the endocrine system. And this is the hypothalamus, a part of the brain that controls and regulates the endocrine system. And there's yet one more tiny gland, even smaller, this itsy bitsy little gland there is called the pineal gland. And it has to do with um, melatonin, which creates the rhythms for night and day, for sleepiness and different things which were regulated in night and day. Okay. So um, I would suggest just studying them until you can label all these with ease. And um, now let's do a really, really quick summary, almost a thumbnail sketch of each gland. Okay, the hypothalamus is the one that regulates everything. Remember, this is actually not the endocrine system, it's part of the brain. So I've called it the general. The pituitary gland, I'm often calling the second in command because it is a gland, it's part of the endocrine system, but it's the gland which controls and regulates many of these other glands. So the general, the second in command, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland secretes hormones which stimulate and regulate other glands. So they're called stimulating or regulating hormones because they're hormones which tell the thyroid to speed up or to slow down, which tell the adrenal glands to secrete hormones or to um, take a rest, and so on. So hypothalamus and pituitary. The parathyroid, it's hard to see, we're going to close in, zoom in on it soon, um, controls calcium concentration. You need you need dissolved calcium electrolytes in your blood, and you need calcium in your bones. The parathyroid controls those concentrations. The thyroid can be summarized by saying it controls metabolism and energy. The thymus is involved in white blood cell development. So it's important for the immune system, specifically for the, the complex, the adaptive immune system, the lymphocytes. So the ones involved in antibodies. The adrenal glands, we could summarize it by saying it's stress response. It makes the famous adrenaline, just as the name implies, adrenal adrenaline, and also makes corticosteroids. The pancreas is regulates blood sugar. So it's the one that's famous because of diabetes. It makes the hormones insulin and glucagon. The H here means the actual hormones they make. So the thyroid makes the hormone thyroxin. And adrenal glands control stress response, response and they make the hormones corticosteroids and adrenaline. Um, and then these, I think you should be quite familiar with them because we just studied them. They do the secondary sex characteristics and they make the sex cells. Um, and these are the famous um, male and female hormones. So 
this is a lot in one slide, but this is a really nice way to get the big picture in a very brief way. This is what I would hope that after we've, we've finished the endocrine system, that um, months from now and even years from now, you would remember this little, little uh, summary. Okay, this is another summary you can read through if you like. And here's yet another image. I'm always indecisive about my images, as you know. Uh, so all these things highlighted are the glands which secrete hormones, which secrete chemical messengers. All right, let's zoom in on the parathyroid because it's hard to see. So the thyroid is here just under your larynx, just under your voice box. This is the thyroid gland. It's involved in metabolism and energy. On the back side, so here you wouldn't be able to see it. It's on the back of her thyroid gland. So here they turn the thyroid around. It's called the posterior part, right, the back part. There's four tiny little glands called parathyroid glands. Um, and they do not have a similar function. The thyroid controls metabolism and energy. These control calcium absorption and calcium levels in the blood. The only reason they have a similar name is because they're neighbors physically, but they don't have a similar function. Um, okay, this is a close-up on the brain. You don't need to know everything on this slide. What do you need to know? The pituitary, this is the head gland. The hypothalamus is this bluish purplish thing. That's the part of the brain that controls the endocrine system. So here's the general, here's the second in command, and this little pineal gland, which controls um, day and nighttime rhythms. They're called circadian rhythms. Uh, okay, this is an important definition. So read it through, write it down. Uh, the basic idea is the glands that we're familiar with, glands that secrete digestive enzymes, sweat, saliva, etc., are called exocrine glands. And the glands we're studying now, the glands that secrete hormones, are called endocrine glands. These secrete into the immediate area, right? If it's in the stomach, the gland will secrete into the opening of the stomach, whereas these have to go through the blood and travel through the bloodstream to reach their target cells. And these, um, the target cells is the name given to the cell which will receive a, the hormonal message. So this is probably a little bit confusing, so let's give a specific example. When the pituitary gland makes FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which we just studied about in the reproductive system, the FSH is meant to, um, to stimulate the cells in the ovary, which are making the, the egg, right? It's a, it's a hormone which stimulates the production of an egg. And it begins at the beginning of every cycle, of a woman's cycle. Well, where does FSH uh, go? What, who needs to receive its message? Your eyes don't need to receive the message. Your ears don't need to receive it. Your knees don't need to, but it will travel to all those places. It will travel in your bloodstream to your entire body. But inside your ovary, there are follicles which have the, um, we'll talk about the receptor proteins, which, which are the target cells, which are the ones which will receive the message of FSH. Estrogen, its target cells are in the endometrium because estrogen causes the endometrium or the uterine lining to build up and so on. Um, let me, okay, this is just another uh, summary, but this time it's in all written form without diagrams in case that helps you. But talking about target cells, this is what we need to better understand. If you recall, receptor proteins are big proteins wedged into the cell membrane, which have the job, this is the receptor protein here, it's not labeled in the diagram, but this Y-shaped thing is a receptor protein. They have the job of binding to the hormone to receive the hormone's message. And this is what defines a target cell. A target cell of oxytocin will have an oxytocin receptor protein. A target cell of estrogen will have an estrogen receptor protein, and so on. So the summary, a hormone acts only upon its target cells by binding to their receptor proteins, triggering a response. If a cell has no target cells for a given hormone, that hormone will just pass through its blood vessels but not affect it, just keep moving. Okay, this is important. This is another diagram. Let's look at the diagram first. Here's the receptor protein. Here's the hormone. And don't worry about all this. But the basic idea is the hormone binds to the receptor protein and triggers something. It sets off an activity or a response. The cell is always going to respond to the hormone. The hormone is telling it to do something or to stop doing something. And um, there's two important things on this slide. The first is what kinds of things will it tell the cell to do or not do? It might tell it to start making proteins. It might tell it to start secreting things. 
It might change its membrane permeability. Tell the membrane, don't let any more of this substance in. Or quick, open up your gates and let in this substance. It might activate a particular chemical reaction and so on. These are examples of things that the hormone might be messaging the cell or stimulating the cell to do. The second concept here is that, as you can see, this hormone doesn't cross the membrane. And so it activates things with um, sending its message across the, the cell membrane and it activates what are called secondary messengers. The secondary messengers are these things in here. Okay, to be honest, there's two kinds of hormones. Some do cross the cell membrane, some don't. Let's start with this one, because this is what we've been looking at more often. A non-steroid hormone, uh, here the hormone is green, the receptor protein is red, they fit together, they bind together, and once they've bound, it activates something in the cell. And here are the secondary messengers, which is going to affect something in the cell. It's activated something. And it's called signal transduction. You might remember that from long ago, when the, the message um, crosses the cell membrane. And this is uh, the more typical scenario. But some hormones, called steroid hormones, they, are, they include sex hormones and corticosteroids, um, can actually cross the cell membrane. And so their receptor proteins are not on the cell membrane, but on the inside the cell. So in this diagram, this is the cell membrane, and this is the nuclear membrane, this is the nucleus. So the, the hormone can cross the cell membrane, and the receptor protein is found inside the cell. And then often they can also even enter the nucleus. And the next part is kind of relevant because what it shows, I hope you recognize this process, hope it rings bells from September and October. It shows um, the DNA making a strand of RNA, which goes to a ribosome and makes a, um, a protein. This is a protein strand. And so this receptoroid hormones are very useful for activating protein synthesis. Um, okay, this is just a close up on it so you can see it a little bit better. And remember that steroids are lipids, so that's why they can cross the phospholipid bilayer so easily. Um, the receptor protein, here it is, found inside the cell. And this is just for you to test yourself, see if you can label everything. Find the receptor protein, find the hormone, figure out which one is steroid, which one's non-steroid. Okay, we're going to skip a bunch of things. We're going to do that later. Here we are. Um, the last thing is to look at the adrenal glands, the little glands atop the kidneys. Just as in other organs, the outer layer of an organ is called the cortex. The inner layer is called the medulla. Uh, when they're distinguished. You might have heard of cerebral cortex in your brain and so on, also the kidneys. The adrenal medulla um, produces a very famous hormone, adrenaline, right, which uh, coordinates your body's immediate response to stress, to some urgency or emergency, to some big problem that needs your immediate attention. The adrenal cortex, the outer part, produces corticosteroids, which is your response to long-term stress. We need to do a very quick review of vasodilation, vasoconstriction. This is the vasoconstriction of a blood vessel. This is its vaso, sorry, this is a normal blood vessel. Sorry about that. This is the vasodilation of a blood vessel. It dilates, it opens up wide. This is the vasoconstriction of a blood vessel. It narrows. This allows much more blood to come. This narrows the flow of blood. So your body has millions of blood vessels and they all have these smooth muscles in them which can dilate or constrict to control blood flow. So your body can control how much circulation is going to different parts of your body. A famous example of that is um, the way that you respond to cold. Why is that important here? Because adrenaline adjusts blood flow in this way. It increases circulation or blood flow to your brain, so you can think about what to do in an emergency, to your muscles and lungs, so you can run and rush and hurry to get out of the burning building, to save someone, to run away from the tiger that's chasing you. Um, because of that, it needs to decrease blood flow to other systems which are considered non-essential, digestive, immune, and reproductive. Those are not essential in the moment of an emergency, so they will receive lesser circulation. As a result, long-term stress will have a bad effect on these things. People will grow thin and have digestive problems. Some people will have abdominal pain. People will be less able to fight off disease and some people can uh, experience a certain amount of infertility as a result of stress. Um, also the famous impact that adrenaline will increase your heart rate and breathing rate for obvious reason. 
increase your glucose metabolism.